Welcome to the Data Center Unit. At the completion of this course, you will be able to define a typical small telecom networking or server room environment, describe a methodology for gathering end user requirements, articulate steps for developing a system concept, identify key physical infrastructure specification elements, and recognize how to interpret CSI specification formats. Establishing a specification for a wiring closet or small computer room requires preparation. Knowledge must be gathered regarding the type of equipment that the room will house, the types of user activities that the room will support, the required availability level, the physical characteristics of the room, the cooling system of the building and of spaces adjacent to the room, the power quality available to the building and the room, and ambient conditions such as heat, humidity, dust, and risk of seismic activity. The planning phase of a small server room design-build project is critical to the overall success and longevity of the server room. Unfortunately, the execution of this important phase often lacks proper attention and focus. Planning mistakes can magnify and propagate through later deployment phases, resulting in delays, cost overruns, wasted time, and ultimately a compromised system. Many issues can be eliminated by properly executing the key steps in the planning phase of the design-build project. In order to demonstrate the execution of a standardized wiring closet design-build methodology, this course is based upon a hypothetical case study. In this case, the company we will focus on is called the Acme Classic Auto Company. Illustrations of best practices from multiple networking room design-build projects will be presented. The course focuses on the physical infrastructure aspects of the networking, telecom, and server room. That is, the foundational cooling, power, rack, and security layers that support the IT and network systems residing inside the physical space. During this course, both user requirements gathering and standard specification generation will be discussed and reviewed. As with any project, various stakeholders play key roles. In this case study, the key stakeholders at Acme include a network manager, Fred Kelly, a facilities engineer, Michael Crawford, and an electrician, Jason Stewart. Let's get started with an overview of Acme Classic Auto. Located in the Midwest region of the United States, Acme Classic Auto was founded in 1985. The company started with 150 employees and has grown into an organization of over 2,500 full and part-time employees. Acme Classic Auto is a reputable manufacturer of classic car parts. For over two decades, Acme has been a manufacturer of choice for customers who enjoy refurbishing classic automobiles. Acme operates from its 100,000 square foot or 30,480 square meter corporate headquarters in Northern Illinois in the United States. Three years after building their data center, Acme launched an initiative to add an e-commerce parts website and full-scale customization facility to its offerings. With these updated additions came a greater need for data protection and network security. These rooms used to be broom closets, and over the years, we incorporated some telecom switches. At that point, we put vents in the door because heat was being produced, and I didn't want any of the equipment armed. Now we have to add some servers and some VOIP equipment in here. That's not trivial, and we needed to come up with some sort of cohesive plan, especially to manage the heat. Kelly had heard about a standardized guide for designing and building small server rooms and networking rooms. The facilities engineer, Michael Crawford, had seen the book on a leading UPS vendor's website, and he decided to acquire the book. I knew that we had five wiring closets to deal with here at Acme. From a power and cooling perspective, I didn't feel like reinventing the wheel five times. I acquired the book so that we could standardize our approach. Since Kelly and Crawford were both leads on the project, they saw the book as a good resource for establishing a common approach to the task that lay ahead. Kelly was concerned with the proper IT and networking horsepower, and Crawford had to make certain that enough power and cooling was available to make sure the systems stayed up and running. 
Now that we have a fundamental understanding of Acme's company background and the factors driving the business decisions, let's take some time and discuss the methodology for addressing the physical infrastructure planning phases of the wiring closet design build project. In order to determine how much power and cooling would be required in the wiring closet rooms, factors such as criticality, capacity, and overall growth plan had to be considered. Crawford and Kelly understood that gathering and documenting user-specific information was a critical success factor for achieving the business objectives of the Acme wiring closets. The system specification and project manual that Crawford and Kelly had acquired provided them with the questions they needed to ask and the forms they needed to fill out. Our guidebook helped us define the system concept for the rooms, establish a process for who does what, and allowed for us to define the list of devices we required in the room. Let's take a look at how Kelly and Crawford tackled the issues of criticality, capacity, and growth plan. Criticality is an expansion of the familiar concept of availability tiers. The criticality selected will determine the major characteristics of the system architecture, such as redundancy of power and cooling systems, as well as the robustness of system monitoring and various room construction details that affect reliability. Kelly and Crawford determined that Acme's wiring closets were criticality level one sites. From an availability perspective, we wanted to design our wiring closets along the lines of a criticality level one. This meant that we planned to deploy a basic NUPS configuration. The cooling and power choices we made in our design plan were modular and scalable and would allow us to right size our installation up front without having to invest in excess capacity. The solution also provided us with monitoring capabilities to the plug level as far as the draw of current. This allows us to be in a much better position to perform proactive preventive maintenance, thereby avoiding any unanticipated system shutdowns. Capacity is the estimated maximum IT power load for the wiring closet over the wiring closet's lifetime. The capacity analysis answers the general question, what size wiring closet do I need? Once established, the capacity parameter determines the upfront build-out of the non-scalable elements of the wiring closet room, such as the required physical room size. It does not mean that all elements in the room will be built up front to support that power load, nor does it imply that the IT load will necessarily ever reach the maximum level. The growth plan consists of four parameters, a set of four numbers that describe the expected growth of the IT power load expressed in watts. These four numbers form the IT load profile that will guide the design of the power system. Uncertainty about future growth is handled by providing both a maximum final load and a minimum final load and assuming the option of a scalable system design that approaches the maximum value in increments over time. Crawford and Kelly discussed the capacity and growth plan in great depth. We anticipate the initial load of the updated wiring closet to be 700 watts, while the minimum final load was estimated to be no less than 1,500 watts, with the maximum final load anticipated to top out at 3,000 watts. This gives us an average final load of approximately 2,250 watts, with a ramp-up time to final load of three years. Given the IT parameters of criticality, capacity, and growth plan, the physical infrastructure systems within the wiring closets could be designed in dozens of different ways. However, a much smaller number of these practical designs actually exists. A library of these optimal designs can be used to quickly narrow down the possibilities. Much like a catalog of kitchen designs at a home improvement store, reference designs provide a choice of general architecture for the design of the system. Reference designs can help in zeroing in or ruling out by presenting designs that may be hard to articulate or perhaps haven't been thought of. Reference designs have most of the system engineering built in with enough variability to satisfy the specific requirements of a range of user projects. Reference designs can be provided by manufacturers, design engineers, or simply by looking at other network rooms recently built. Kelly needed to start piecing together enough information to produce an initial wiring closet reference design. 
To accomplish this task, he sat down jointly with Crawford and their electrician, Jason Stewart. Both Crawford and Stewart had knowledge of the physical limitations of the wiring closet sites and understood the capabilities of some of the updated technologies being considered. The team utilized their specification book and the worksheets within to simplify and validate the process. Crawford explains, I documented some of the initial system design concepts utilizing my system concept worksheet and my device details worksheet. This helped us work out our primary physical infrastructure equipment vendor to select a wiring closet reference design that helped establish a design standard for our updated wiring closets. To translate the user requirements into a design, the system specification and project manual utilized by Crawford and Kelly incorporated a number of additional worksheets, which helped them to address key elements of the design. Areas addressed by the worksheets included delivery path, which is how the equipment gets from the loading dock to the wiring closet floor, structural elements such as existing walls, floors, roof, stairs, and doors, power, which includes distribution, source, and backup, cooling, which includes airflow, surrounding rooms and spaces, and racks, meaning the size, locations, capacities, and weight. The first areas to be addressed included the delivery path from the loading dock to the five wiring closets and the structural elements such as doors and walls. Kelly and Crawford concluded that, due to the size of the equipment that would be delivered and because of the local code regulations, the elevator would have a 5,000-pound capacity and would be capable of supporting a maximum of six adults. The stairs from the loading dock to the wiring closets on the second floor would have to be a minimum of six feet across. Hallways would be designed to be 72 inches across and nine feet high. Standard door clearances of 30 inches across and 7 feet high were also documented. The wiring closet doors, it was decided, would also have a minimum of one hour fire rating. They also made sure that the perimeter walls would have a fire rating that complied with fire code, insurance company, and lease requirements. In order to determine how much cooling was needed for the new wiring closets, Kelly and Crawford had to first determine the size of the IT load. These were figures that Kelly was able to provide to Crawford so that he could properly size the power and cooling required for the room. The size of the load helped determine the size of the UPS that would be required. By calculating the size of the UPS and by considering the amounts of solar gain, lights, fans, and other heat sources that the wiring closet rooms would be exposed to, Crawford was able to determine how much cooling was needed for each of the five wiring closets. Jason Stewart, Acme's chief electrician, was deemed the team's most qualified person to answer primary power, UPS, PDU, wiring closet user requirements. Stewart first identified the total spare capacity of the electrical service entrance by identifying the preferred source input voltage to the UPS and the PDUs. Next, he identified the total spare current of the sub-panel feed to the room and amps so he could accurately state how much current would be available from the sub-panel to power the UPS and PDUs. Finally, Stewart went on to identify what kind of rack power distribution was required. For me, remote management of these wiring closets was important. I wanted to monitor how much power was going into the rack and wanted control over power going into individual rack outlets. For this reason, Jason Stewart recommended that the power be distributed via a switched rack power distribution scheme. Protecting the wiring closet from environmental disruption, human error, physical theft, and or sabotage, along with proactively monitoring and managing several functions from one platform, were all identified as important design considerations by the team. So let's explore how they documented the room monitoring user requirements. Kelly discusses the plan for the monitoring and management of the updated wiring closets. We recently deployed an updated physical security system, which includes door cards, cameras, and motion detectors in our data center. Our preference is to utilize a similar approach in our updated wiring closet. The final worksheet that Kelly and Crawford needed to complete as part of the wiring closet user requirements documentation dealt with the issue of racks. The existing infrastructure in the old wiring closet consisted of outdated racks. 
computer equipment was getting deeper, and the old racks would not support the updated equipment. Acme made a strategic decision not to reuse any of the existing racks from the old wiring closet. The system specification and project manual had a section dedicated to communications cabinets, racks, frames, and enclosures. This included specifications on weight load and rack configuration. The system specification and project manual not only offered Kelly and Crawford a methodology for gathering user requirements and generating user specifications, but it also served as a guideline for the construction of the wiring closet space. To facilitate the construction process, the standard specifications portion of the manual was organized using the Construction Specifications Institute, or CSI, numbering system. The Construction Specifications Institute is an organization that maintains and advances the standardization of construction language as it pertains to building specifications. CSI provides structured guidelines for specification writing in their project resource manual, formerly called the Manual of Practice, or MOP. Master Format is a master list of numbers and titles classified by work results or construction practices, primarily used to organize project manuals, organize detailed cost information, and relate drawing notations to specifications. Efficient information retrieval is only possible when a standard filing system is used by everyone involved in the project. Master Format provides such a standard filing and retrieval scheme that can be used throughout the construction industry. In addition to the use of CSI, the specification book also includes helpful specification tags. Let's discuss that next. The design of an IT space must balance total cost of ownership with the importance of the activity supported by the room. To address this trade-off, some of the standard specifications in ACME System Specification and Project Manual were marked with high availability tags denoted by the symbol shown here. These tags designate availability performance beyond basic capabilities that might be required of any small room IT space. The high availability tag denotes design characteristics such as redundant power, enhanced system monitoring capabilities, and more robust room construction. If no tag is shown, the specification applies to any installation. In the example shown here, the first item applies to all systems because it shows no high availability tag. The second item applies only to systems requiring a higher level of availability. Since we were intent on being able to manage our wiring closets remotely, we applied the specification that stated that our rack-oriented power strip PDUs allow the outlets to be remotely switched over the network via our physical infrastructure management system. We saw this particular spec as an enhancement to our overall systems availability plan. In addition to guiding the wiring closet's design-build process, the use of defensible language in the system specification and project manual also served as an insurance policy. Let's move forward now and discuss the implication of defensible language in specifications. In the realm of wiring closet specifications, should a dispute arise between the wiring closet owner and a contractor tasked with building part or all of a wiring closet, the word defensible implies specification language that is unambiguous. In a courtroom, clear language eliminates any doubt as to the intent and meaning of the specification in question. If specifications are unclear, or if the language of specifications is vague, the project will be delayed and project costs will rise. In addition, to help verify contractor compliance to specifications, the specifications must include the words shall or must rather than should. The words should or may conveys a recommendation that is not legally binding. The word shall or must conveys an action that is binding and legally defensible. This is the type of specification language that allows a wiring closet manager to legally verify and mandate that their wiring closet is in compliance with the design specifications. 
Not all of the specifications in Kelly's and Crawford's system specification and project manual were implemented. During the actual construction process, electrical and HVAC tradespeople were assigned specifications to work on based upon the CSI numbering scheme of the manual. A plumbing contractor, for instance, was made responsible for executing on specifications under the 220500 number, which is entitled Common Work Results from Plumbing. However, from time to time, contractors run across a specification that requires a higher criticality or a specification that is in conflict with other items that represent an alternative implementation. In these cases, both the contractor and the owner agree to apply the well-known industry convention of marking items that do not apply to the project by just crossing it out and marking it NIC, or not in contract. With a well-written specification in hand, both Crawford and Kelly were ready to begin implementation. Rules for walls, floor, ceiling, and doors, as well as clearances, plumbing, finishes, and lighting were all part of their system specification and project manual. According to Crawford, The book pointed us in the right direction by laying out many of the standard best practices. For example, the following points were made. Wall and flooring finishes shall reduce static electricity. Floor shall not be carpeted. No exterior doors or exterior windows shall be present unless required by safety code. Ceiling tiles shall be flush and level and shall not require the removal or displacement of mechanical or electrical infrastructure. These specifications allowed us to focus on the key elements necessary to set up the walls, floor, and ceiling of the room and the power, cooling, security racks, and fire suppression in the room. Kelly states, The spec book helped me establish some guidelines and best practices for electrical considerations such as grounding and bonding, cable trays, labeling, power distribution, UPSs, and maintenance receptacles. Some examples of the types of specifications followed include electrical power to the loads shall be uninterruptible, voltage, current, and frequency shall comply with local and national requirements, the rack-oriented power strip PDU shall display the current of each input phase. Cable trays, wiring troughs, and cable ladders shall not be enclosed unless required by local code or the authority having jurisdiction. Next, Kelly and Crawford needed to address the cooling needs in their wiring closets. Let's look at that topic next. Heat can be removed from a small confined space like a wiring closet in five different ways. These include conduction, where heat can flow through the walls of the space, passive ventilation, where the heat can flow into cooler air via a vent or grill without an air-moving device, fan-assisted ventilation, where heat can flow into cooler air via a vent or grill that does have an air-moving device, comfort cooling, where heat can be removed by a building's comfort cooling system, and dedicated cooling, where heat can be removed by a dedicated air conditioner. Crawford and Kelly had all of these choices available to them in the spec book. If they choose to build up their installation in the wiring closet gradually, they could select the appropriate cooling method. Since they determined that the overall capacity of the closet would reach 3,000 watts and that the room size was small, but that critical equipment was being housed, the team opted for a dedicated heat removal system. We decided that the more controlled the environment was, the more we would be in a position to maximize the uptime of these VOIP applications residing in our five wiring closets. Although the dedicated cooling represented a higher cost, we felt it was easily justified. Once the room, power, and cooling specifications were incorporated into the reference design and plan, the security specifics were addressed. The team discussed two facets of security, access control and video surveillance. Once again, they looked to their system specification and project manual for guidance. Some examples of their security specifications include room entrance shall be controlled via card access control system, electronic door locks shall default to the unlocked position during a power interruption, and video surveillance system shall integrate with a building CCTV system. 
It is impossible to not think about fire suppression equipment when discussing the security and safety of the physical infrastructure. The team addressed this next. When discussing the topic of fire protection, the team consulted local fire codes and not only looked at fire suppression, but also heat and smoke detection. Some of the specifications from the manual that the ACME team decided to deploy included the following. The room shall be provided with the same fire suppression system used in the rest of the building. Fire suppression equipment shall be designed to 7 by 24 by 365 operation. Sprinkler systems shall conform to local and national fire codes. The room shall be provided with the same smoke detection system used in the rest of the building. Smoke detectors shall be labeled and numbered. Utilizing a standardized system specification book was deemed a critical success factor for the ACME team. Crawford comments. Our specifications included requirements, projections, and key project steps. When issues were encountered, we referred to our specifications document for clarification. If we found that a particular specification was out of scope or no longer relevant, we simply marked it NIC and moved on with our deployment. The fact that both Fred Kelly and I had one design-build manual to work from helped us to achieve closure quickly during the design phase and helped us to more easily navigate the engineering and construction phases. With the help of the documented specifications, Crawford and Kelly had clear guidance from which to work. As a result, the team avoided the problem of having to implement an unanticipated design. When asked if ACME would have done anything differently, Kelly states, The project was clearly facilitated through our use of a standardized system specification manual. It kept us on track so that we could achieve our target milestones, and it provided us with enough flexibility in design so that we could work around constraints and fulfill most of our users' preferences for properly functioning wiring closets. Let's conclude with a brief summary. Let's review some of the information that we have covered throughout the course. Wiring closets are no longer just spare rooms that are populated with IT and communications equipment. They require significant design planning in order to sustain application availability goals. Best practices involve establishment of user requirements, development of specification, and implementation of standards. Standardized physical infrastructure best practice guides are available to help companies save time and money when deploying wiring closet rollout projects.